Okay. Students, today we are going to discuss Zoo 122 on the topic uh, basic parastology. Um, this is part of what we are going to do in the course of this study for this second semester. And um, we are going to look at the aspect of the pathology and the pathogenesis of parasitic diseases at its effect and influenced other living organisms including animals, human, and all others. Now, pathology, we said, is the branch of medical sciences that study the causes and nature and effect of disease. In other words, the causes of any deviation from a healthy and a normal condition. That is exactly what it means. Most importantly of note is the causes and the nature and the effects of the disease. What led to say a disease condition? What causes disease? There must be a source of the cause of disease. And what is that organism that is involved in the cause of this disease? How is the nature of that organism? And what are the effects which it produces that we can see, you know, and um, possibly detect through certain symptoms? And then an individual is come down with an illness. So the causes, the nature, and the effect of disease is very paramount to understanding what pathology is all about. Is simply deviation from what from a healthy and a normal condition. What about pathogenesis? Pathogenesis, we say, is the origination and development of a disease or able to cause disease. Simply put, able to cause disease, which is pathogenic. This, the level of severity, you know, determine the pathogenicity of the infection per se of an individual. Now, let's quickly look at the pathology and the pathologist all together. It is the parasitic disease or organisms that cause disease which are referred to as pathogens. These pathogens are living organisms that causes infection among humans, among animals, and other primates, even in the wildlife. And so therefore, it could also go to that extent to infect the vertebrates and the invertebrate as a whole. And so the parasitic disease, or rather the organism, is the major cause of a disease, at which most of these diseases are referenced to what? To pathogens, or rather referred to as pathogens. What about the parasites? We said parasites have impacted mankind over age even from history infections has been as a result of infections of parasites uh, the inflicting damage uh, that is seen on man and his domestic animals has been in history therefore disease itself is the consequence of a parasitic infection number two Pathogenic organisms cause diseases which are manifested in diverse forms. This pathogenic organism can cause diseases in various forms that will um, uh, uh, explain the symptoms that is observed or observable in said an individual suffering from the illness. And those are the manifestations. I have listed here in their diverse forms. Number three, the disease, or rather the diseases, are observable. One, as clinical manifestations. Two, and pathologi uh, pathological transformations. 
Now, let's go back again to pathogenesis from where I start. Looking at its basis. The pathogenesis we are talking about in Greek referred to as pato, meaning disease. And then genesis, meaning origin. So it deals with the causes and development and effects of a pathogen. What we should also consider again from my previous definition, I told you that the pathology of every living organism depends on the outlook of the nature of the organism and the degree of clinical and pathological manifestations, which usually are determined by quite a number of factors listed below. And we are going to look at these factors, which are considered determinant factors in clinical and pathological manifestations of diseases. One, the intensity of infection. If an individual gets infected today, it is determined by the intensity of the infection, the level of severity, and this counts on the determinant factors that also declared this clinical uh, attention from whoever that will have to attend to an individual. So the intensity means the degree of infection, the severity of the infection. In most cases when you have malaria for example and then you have one plus and others you have you can see they have two plus and they have three plus. It shows the intensity of the infection how severe malaria infections has invaded such an individual. Number two, the nature of the parasite. How is the nature of the parasite or the organism that must have infected an individual in the long run? And so therefore, the nature of the parasite is a determining factor that determines the possibility of the organism capable to infect an individual. What is the type of organism we are talking about? It could be roundworms, it could be tapeworms, it could be hookworms, it could be a protozoan infection and all that. And the nature of the parasite is also a determining factor to clearly determine the clinical and pathological manifestation of the diseases. Number three, number of infective bites or rather inoculations by the sector of degree of host exposure to the parasite is also another factor. Meaning that, for instance, how many times a mosquito will bite you at point in time or rather inoculations that it can be introduced into man. And by these processes, we are talking about the sector of degree of host exposure, you know, to the parasite. It means how many times have you been exposed to mosquito bite or the black fly bite because they are bitten by the insects and how many times per day, per minute, per hour, and for how many days have you been bitten, even while I sleep and while I wake or while at work. Number three, sorry, number four, parasite habitats. We are able to know that as they exist as living organisms, they have places in which they live uh, in man, in animals. Uh, in most cases, we consider that as the predilection site where they inhibit in the body of an animal, including human. For instance, like the malaria infection, which introduces uh, cases of uh, malaria or malariosis in man. After the beating of the insect, we are meant to understand that the proboscis are used to pierce through the skin of the human and then introduced in the course of feeding because they feed on human blood and animals. And so, coincidentally, 
these parasites are introduced, this plasmodium, all right, are introduced into the, through the skin and through the feeding processes and through the bloodstream. So, we are meant to understand that parasites reside or inhibit the circulatory system, which is carried around by virtue of the life cycle, you could be able to determine first the pre-erythrocytic pre cycle and before the erythrocytic cycle. And so therefore, the first destination of this malaria infection will rightly go straight to the blood stream and then before it is taken around through the circulation. And so there are other organisms like roundworms, like Trachenelia spiralis, that is usually found in the muscle of an individual. In the muscle, in the skin, all right, of man, there you can find them, whether at the larva form or at the adult form. Now, the next factor again is age. At what age most of humans suffer parasite of malaria? At what age most uh, humans suffer from roundworms? I'm giving this as an example simply because uh, it is most closely for us to understand it easier and faster. When you look at children, they are most vulnerable. And so, at that stage, they are most exposed to the bite of parasite, like malaria, exposed to the roundworms, like ascaris or ascariasis. So, so many infections are exposed to these vulnerable children at this tender age. So, age is a factor. And then there are other diverse status too of the host that could also be affected immunological competence, which also could be determined in considering the age of an individual. And what about the status of the host? Either your immunological competence or not, then that also added to your the vulnerability of uh, coming in contact or being infected with this uh, parasite and organisms I've mentioned. Now, the nature of the parasite damaged and clinical impacts are varied and diverse. The nature of the parasite actually damaged, you know, wherever the predilection site, wherever it in inhibit in any part of the body, there is cause of damage. The tissue are affected. They infiltrate, they proliferate, and so cause damage to the tissues and the surrounding tissues. In fact, of most important, even the cells, in most cases, they are affected. And that is why the immunological status is mostly considered and to determine the competence of your immune status. And clinical impacts are varied and diverse because it depends on how you respond to certain diseases, respond to certain infections, as the case may be. Now, the next is the nature of the disease manifestation, which means the range from simple morbidity. What do I mean by simple morbidity? It simply means uh, the manifestations, which in most cases, uh, individuals react to. And in most cases, they are considered as allergic. When you show certain reactions regarding to certain infections, it shows the nature of the disease that you get infected and simply displayed certain reactions, then it means you are allergic to that particular reactions of this infection. Now, the next nature of the disease manifestation again is the inflammation. Because inflammation also makes it look clearly that there's the damage to the tissue or the surrounding tissues or the associate um, a cellular environment that is uh, very closely uh, to the site of infection that must have caused the damage of the area. And so tissue leases 
can be understood and can be observed as well as the dead tissues or dead cells can also be observed uh, which is referred to as necrosis it can be necrotic in nature and then the uh, uh, breaking down of these tissues uh, uh, leading to the dead of these uh, tissues and cells could also be understood. Now, it could result in different forms and it could be observed based on the level, the extent of the infection. It could either be at an acute cases or it could either be in the chronic uh, uh, stage. But in any case, uh, what you observe and the outcome of it is the tissue lysis and then the necrosis that will set in and eventually or rather sometimes death is set in. Now as a consequence certain diseases has led to major drawbacks in mankind's development over the centuries because this has been in history this has been in record because we say diseases are consequences as a result of what as a result of infection. And certain diseases has led to these major drawbacks in terms of what human development, mankind, even at workplace. If you have malaria today, you are out of workplace because you have malaria. And so the work for the day is not being worked for. And then it's empty and then affecting the economy. So therefore, the drawbacks in mankind's development over the centuries has been on record. So you can take an example as well too, like HIV. <laughs> when HIV infection comes on board, you discover that a lot of people have this uh, debility to work, to go out effectively, to work proficiently, effectively, and yet there was a setback, you know, in mankind's development. These are examples, and I can go on and go on with series of examples of similar. And so many parasitic diseases are of public health importance. That I want us to know, particularly in the developing tropical nations, because we are referring to these developing tropical nations as the low-income nations. In fact, in the past, they used to be considered as the so-called third world countries, where poverty eats them up, ignorance and squalor prevail. I mean, a dirty environment that you can see everywhere just like I see in most part of Africa today, even here in this part of our continent, here in Nigeria and right here in Abuja and right here in Kefi. There are so many suburb areas where you cannot just be willing and be peacefully to even get through those environment because of the dirty nature of the environment. So poverty, ignorance and squalor, a dirty environment prevailed among the indigenous population. What are we talking about? We are talking about the inhygienic state or condition that a lot of population that lived in. You know, negligence to all this warrant uh, determine so many factors that will lead to an uprising what in disease uh, prevalences. And that is why there sometimes there are sudden causes of infections around and then um, many people come in contact with it and children are most vulnerable. To this infection. Now, this leads us to the next uh, level where I uh, will have to understand parasite and parasitic diseases diagnosis. Most importantly, the diagnosis of the parasites or parasitic diseases diagnosis. Now, how do I mean? The parasitic diseases diagnosis they are most the integral integral part of understanding and then the knowledge of their prevention and control you know is the leading cause of why the study of parasites and the parasitic diseases without diagnosis we cannot be able to you know to arrive conclusively if not tentatively what is the cause of this infection and so as we could understand as we get along we'll see certain parasites we are going to mention in the course of this study and then you will get to know that oh they can cause infection even in the course of a human endeavor so 
the parasitic disease diagnosis are or form the integral part you know to our understanding and then having the knowledge of their prevention and control giving us an insight on how we can prevent it and how we can control it and by so doing that we help the society or the populace there are different approach to the methods and tools in the diagnosis of parasite and parasitic diseases and what are these methods <laughs> now we have been in a more broad spectrum of diagnostic approaches which i present here below now these are the diagnostic methods which include chemical approach may incorporate algorithms how do i mean by algorithms we will get to understand it later now direct parasite demonstration which is more of morphological and definitive and then microscopy which is more of parasitological test most often times we go to hospitals and then they will tell you that you have a, uh, um, an infection and um, and it is not yet detected it is not yet known and it cannot be described they will ask you to bring your stool bring your urine the stool you 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 present for the test is uh, the parasitological uh, test method so it is more or less referred to as well the microscopy in most cases they will tell you csm which means culture sensitivity and microscopy that's what it means so for microscopy it is parasitological test different away from chemical approach and the direct parasite demonstration which more or less you can look at them morphologically and then them, uh, be able to arrive or determine the cause of the infection what about the indirect methods the indirect methods uh, include the rapid diagnostic test which we are much familiar with today uh, it is simply called the RDTs and then we have the molecular diagnosis which is very rare even our disposition today it is very rare but again it is available in some part of the country which molecular diagnosis is being used now <coughs> we have our chemically based test and then we have immunodiagnosis then we have serology we have xenodiagnosis we have radiological and scanning techniques and we have histological test we have culture which is more in vitro and the animal inclination which is what in vivo finally we have skin test so all this comes as well as indirect methods now let's go back to the word i was referring earlier on the word algorithms here it is is the logical step-by-step -step procedure to establish disease presence in an organism and all those step-by-steps -step is all the direct and the indirect uh, method of approach i have already mentioned so the are uh, steps that are taken to verify to establish disease condition of an individual and that is why it has to be done logically step by step and in all it is a procedure that needs to really establish the cause of an infection in an individual now diagnostic approaches can be based on individual or community diagnosis how do i mean as an individual as a person and as a whole because in most cases you could discover that chemotherapy comes up where again uh ambulatory clinic which is embarked or upon now people can be treated people can be vaccinated community by community to wipe away and to prevent and to stop the infection of certain pathogens ahead of time or which is current and recurrent all right and maybe sudden sudden occurrences of infection so diagnostic approaches can be based on individual or community base 
therefore at this point we'll be able to uh, understand that when infections occur in any part of the community in any part of the society or wherever you live either a home or in a suburb and or urban then there is a way we can approach it is by simply way of intervention and this intervention is the next part of the topic we are going to discuss as control of parasitic diseases how do we control parasitic diseases that must have come up as infections to man as infection to individual as infection to the community at large some time ago or in 2019 we had COVID-19 and that is it was just if it was more or less it was beyond a continental infection or an outbreak it was more a global outbreak that every in fact from every part of the world you know was affected by this pandemic and so therefore how do we go about controlling COVID-19 that is the process we are talking about um, cases of um, river blindness can come up to as a result of the bite of the black fly which causes onchocerciasis by the genus onchocerca volvolus it transmits this parasite in an individual and that is why you see in the society today there are many blind people as a result of what of this bite of the black fly so how do we control you know the bite of a black fly how do we control the infection of ascariasis which is common among children that is the run worms because it is gotten from sand it is gotten from um, food water contaminated with the eggs of ascaris how do we prevent them now this is the process we are discussing right away control in essence is the reduction of disease incidence perfect prevalence or morbidity to a locally acceptable level as a result of deliberated efforts how do i mean disease incidents can occur anywhere anytime accidentally incidentally and it could be a recurrent decima you know to be part and parcel of the community of an individual and so control now helps to reduce this disease incidence by way of prevalence or the rate of spread of this infection all right to a certain level or rather to a locally acceptable level you know as a result of deliberated efforts and what is this effort then this effort we are going to see maybe in cases where high hygiene or personal hygiene is taken into cognizance that we must keep the environment clean we must cut our grasses low below minimal level that yes it will be suitable you know and accommodating within a given environment safety for insect habitation safety for mosquito bites and then uh, our gutters drainages must be drained of all deaths and hold up of waters so this are deliberated word effort if that is taken into note then you are approaching the process of control which is leading to the reduction of this disease which would have been much more devastating if left unattended if left deliberated efforts not been put in force now the continual intervention measures are required to maintain the reduction because if you don't maintain it as a regular checkup i remember some years back during buhari's regime in the military time they come up all right with a policy and title it war against indiscipline and so environmental sanitation was highly of health simply because environments must be kept clean and i tell you that time there were less and minimal you know infections as we were experiencing that time but today all these things are gone 
And so if effort is not put into, and then there is continuation in our effort, then in fact history will be left to decide for itself. Now, the geographical boundaries of parasitic are determined by the state of care, how much concern, how much care, that is mean treatment, how much also effort has been put again for vaccination and all that. That's what it means by the state of care. What about the provision? Who provides it? Where is the means coming from? Where is the source? Or how do we go about the source on meeting up to combat this infection? So the level of health promotion comes from here. It comes from an individual. It comes from a community. And so the level of health promotion is very paramount, is very important, you know, to the society and um, the world at large. Because if health promotion is not adhered, is not really strictly being followed, or hold on to as a policy, then it means that nation is at the mercies of pathogens, at the mercies of infections, is left to be at the mercies of poverty and all that may be an influences to human conditions or state of health as we can understand uh, the positive aspect of a, a health promotion. What about climatic conditions? Of course, uh, certain climatic conditions are a hazard. They contribute as well to the spread of infections in the society. Take for instance, heat. It promotes mosquitoes. <laughs> it promotes mosquitoes. Heat also promotes what? Laying of eggs. And so many in fact, at the end of the whole condition, you will discover that certain things go sore because of heat. Infrastructural developments are affected. Infrastructural developments are been limited simply because there are conditions to where parasitic are determined. So climatic conditions and infrastructural developments are a components that are really needs to be considered, you know, as part of the factors which is determined uh, under the geographical boundaries. Now, personal hygiene, which I have mentioned and I've talked about it, is very, very important to an individual, to the listener of this um, lecture. Diagnostic capabilities is also needs to be upheld. Because why? Without diagnosis, uh, there won't be uh, understanding the cause of illnesses in the society today. So diagnostic capabilities should be a proficiency one, uh, a thing that needs or requires a professionalism. So if you are not a profession, you won't be able to carry out this diagnosis. So diagnostic approach must be taken you know, upon the professionals who can display their capabilities, you know, of uprooting, you know, the cause of an illness in the society. So your personal hygiene is most paramount because it boils down to an individual world uh, care. I go further again to look at the disease boundaries, which uh, are much modified due to control effort. One at the national international and the local levels because cut across it is not just restricted to international it is not just only restricted to national it is not only just restricted to local levels but it is all together an integral affairs of both international national and local level you know putting up a lot of efforts you know cutting boundaries uh, so that effort of health promotion can be achieved. In furtherance, global efforts are on the increase to control parasitic diseases, which you could see today where we have UNICEF, where we have WHO, and then we have so other uh, United Nations uh, components and agents that are working globally 
you know, fatten the menace of this disease or parasitic diseases in our midst today. The need for such effort has become apparent because health is a global good. And again, the increased humanitarian activities at global and local levels increase global involvement. How do I mean? If you look and check our borders today, or the geographical or the global boundaries, you will discover that so many humanitarian activities go on there, in and out, and at the edge of the borders. And so therefore, it increases what? Global involvement to check met all right health promotion where it is ignored that it needs to be taken seriously having some agencies some health agencies informed that really will have to check made this even at the global boundaries because there are so many humanitarian activities uh, in those ages so they need to bridge the gap otherwise <laughs> it will be a big problem even from now and in the future to come. How do I mean? The gap between the rich and the poor nations. Like I've said before, uh, part of Africa, which is our continent today, used to be part of what? The continent that was referred to as the, the so-called third world nations, which were considered, I have listed them before, in terms of poverty, in terms of uh, squalor, in terms of... Uh, so many dirty things that you can think of that they cannot even be dependent, I mean independent, but they were rather dependent on other nations for their survival. <coughs> All right? And so we need to encourage equity in wealth and health. And that will also bring, uh, uh, would bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. So by this, it will have contributed to the various ongoing control efforts as part of the health promotion today. Now, many diseases are controllable, but few are candidates of eradication and elimination. You can't eradicate all parasites, all infections you cannot. Some, again, you can eliminate them, and some you cannot eliminate them. In fact, it is very difficult to even eradicate because of what because of their genetical makeup most of these organisms you see they can decide to change into a different strain and then give you the difficulty of arriving conclusively in approaching uh, the remedy of this infection check for example the hiv for how many years it has been a battle and yet it has not been able to get eradicated because of what it changes a different strain at any point in time. At a point you are getting at it, it is changing to another. You know, subtypes are begin to develop by it just because of what? Uh, the process of um, a genetic mutation. So, uh, most importantly, I want to mention here, lastly, is the development of uh, vaccines against parasitic diseases uh, which will advance disease control and eradication. If we could have vaccines, you know, produced against certain infections in the society, in fact, it's one of the major disease control. And as well, too, uh, can be considered the eradication of that particular infection or disease organism, simply because once there is vaccine, and no matter how it exists, there won't be increased, there won't be reduction, but it will be dominant. So it will be re uh, rendered redundant. So, and the process of eradication must have been achieved. That's what I mean by advanced diseases control and eradication by way of what? Development of vaccines against parasitic diseases. Now, in our next subtopic again, which we need to treat, is the parasitic diseases and infection. Parasitic diseases and infection. 
Parasitic diseases, we've looked at it in the previous form, as well infection. What is a parasite? By its definition, we say it's an organism that lives off another organism, typically attaching itself to feed from the vitamins, blood, bowels, or other various bodily fluids. That is a parasite. You know, a parasite lived a luxuriant life. Is a master of an individual. Is a big man in an individual. That it will only sit and wait for you to feed it. If you don't feed it, in other words, you are harmed. And it might lead you to death. They don't cultivate. They don't work for their survival. But you work for their survival. And you work for also your survival. In as much as you need to be nourished, they are rather being nourished instead of you being nourished. So you can see how terrible the parasite is. How terrible an organism is. So it lives as an attachment in the body of an individual. In other words, intestinal parasites are microorganisms that live in the intestine. Some cause problems, while others can live for long periods in the bowel without causing symptoms or requiring treatment. But in any case, parasitic diseases are more common than most people realize and can strike anyone regardless of race, age, or social status. Let's look at it again. I said is the common is more common you know than most people realized and can strike anyone regardless of race whether you are black or you are white you are red you are Caucasian or whatever color it doesn't care it doesn't matter is it age whatever range of age you belong to the parasitic disease you know, don't realize that. It's strike. What about your social status? You could be rich, you could be poor. It doesn't matter. It can strike you. <coughs> That's what I mean. Now, there are certain amount of parasites that are namely uh, found on the skin and bedding of every human being. Uh, dust mite and other tiny harmless mite can also uh, be found in the household. Uh, in, in the past, you discovered that your mattresses uh, used to have a, uh, some mites and even the skin, especially those who are hairy and cannot maintain it, you know, they begin to have issues like lice, body louses and all that. Even the household mite can also be found now harmful parasite however can cause a great of damage to the human body if not properly treated so most of these can cause a lot of uh, distress in an individual can cause a lot of pain and then one comes down with illness and if left unattended then it will cause a lot of harm and then it will eventually bring the, an individual down, I mean, becoming sick. And if continuously let on attended, it may sometimes lead to death of the person. <coughs> now, very interesting subtopic again, which we are going to treat today, is on the parasitic diseases causes. What are these parasitic causes? What are these parasitic diseases causes? Parasitic diseases is typically caused by the parasite entry into the body via the skin or mouth. In fact, that's what we call the oral fecal root transmission. So it's either it passed through the, the skin, because this skin you see, it is porous, it is semi-permeable, that certain things have to pass through your skin, or rather through mouth in terms of drinking water, in terms of feeding, in which either 
is contaminated and so you come down with the parasitic diseases so it is typically caused by what the parasites entry into the body via the skin or mouth it is not unusual to pick up parasitic infections from soil typically by either walking barefoot or allowing entry through the feet or by placing the hands in the dirt and eventually placing the fingers in the mouth often people carry a parasite without ever knowing it because directly or indirectly knowingly or unknowingly a lot of people or a lot of individuals sometimes carry this parasite without knowing especially those who lived who who, who refused to trim their fingernails as part of the fashion in fact they harbor a lot of infections through that most especially this parasitic disease even this currency was used in exchange of goods and buying of goods in fact even itself as it passes through so many hands hands are contaminated money itself is contaminated with parasitic diseases so this is how diseases can be caused what about worms worms are prolific little creatures they are prolific what little creatures it means they are a wonderful creature that can't cause a lot of harm to man and so they are of note that needs to be attended in terms of intervention prevention and control they can release tens of thousands of eggs at a time and is the egg or the freshly hatched larvae that we inadvertently picked up as we walk barefoot or in a garden which is uh, uh, which the soil is infected so these are the processes that one can come in contact with what with the parasitic diseases via the eggs that have been laid there are eggs that can live in the soil for so long time and with no effect no matter the heat parasitic infection may spread through contaminated water fruits vegetables grain poultry fish or meat and again i said parasite in addition can be transferred from pets to honor in fact most of the human infections today is mostly traced to animals so no wonder that it can be transferred from pets to honor it can be transferred from animals to the individual taming them or keeping them or the animal farmer so to say now since children spend more time outdoors they are more likely than others to expose to parasites yes like mosquito bite at the late hours they can be beaten by mosquito all right and so they might be more exposed than others in terms of coming in contact with the infection parasites such as lice are caused through human contacts with a person who is infected with lice particularly head lice it used to be very easily transmitted you know as head to head meets in terms of play in terms of sleeping together all right particularly among children even not children but even among adulthood all right easy passing from one head to another you know meaning the human contact is established but ticks can be picked up through walking outdoors close contact with a dog or cats or being brought in in from outside in various packages ticks you know they almost uh uh, can easily be found among the ears of dogs, cow, cattle, uh, sheep, goats, and all that. Particularly animals of the domestics. You know, you can find ticks, even they are loaned, and then you can find them. Then it can be walk, you know, from the outdoors close to the contact with a dog or cat, and they usually brought in from the outside. In various packages it all depends how it was brought from the outside now mosquitoes are parasites which simply attack human for their blood 
and live as quickly as they can. Sharply, fastly, snappy. That is how they do. Once they attack human, from the smell, they have what we call pheromones that really enables them to detect the smell of human. And so once they're able to detect, they go closer and then siphon. Sharply you hear a sharp pain and off it goes in a snappy way. Now here we talk about the roundworms. Roundworms exist worldwide, especially in warmer climate. 25% of the world population may be infected with roundworms. How do I mean? It means which can uh, reach the size of pencils. And that is, that is the, the size of the roundworms if you, if you measure it. All right, sometimes again, uh, by measurement, the pencil, if you measure the measurement, how many centimeters will it give you? You can do it practically in your home, in your hostels, and then you could be able to determine the size of a roundworm. And this includes hookworms, whipworms, pinworms, and trachinae. Hookworms, we said, migrate down the digestive tracts where they attach to intestine walls and ingest blood. The victim may experience symptoms like nausea, that is feeling like vomiting, indigestion, not, that is means, uh, it means improper digestion of the food content, and then you have diarrhea uh, in some extreme cases, anemia, you don't have enough blood, and then you are restless, meaning restlessness. These are the things you observe and you will experience. What about the whipworms? The whipworms are a small, about three to five centimeters long and infect large intestine. What about the pinworms? They are the most common roundworms in US. I mean in United States. And inhabit most crowded areas such as schools, the care centers and mental hospitals. They are they are most uh, can be contacted. You know where there is a crowd, particularly in schools or in care centers, uh, in, 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 in more a rather uh, 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 refreshment centers and others, including the mental hospitals. So roundworms can be as much as possible uh, come in this form and it is more devastating in U.S. They can be as contagious as the flu and usually infect several members of one's uh, family. What about trachenia? A tiny roundworm found in the muzzle of infected animals usually pigs that cause trichinosis, disease characterized by intestinal disorder, fever, muscular swelling, pain, and insomnia. Therefore, care must be taken to avoid eating pork meat since even a small uncooked portion can lead to infection. Now, at this point in time, we we'll also have a uh, protozoa too, which is considered a single cell protozoa or a eukaryotic cells organism, which permeates the environment and harm more people worldwide than any other parasite. So protozoa form cyst or a resting stage where they become resistant to temperature extremes in fact, even at 4 degrees centigrade, uh, a macrosporidia spore can live to survive in the soil, no matter the heat or no matter the temperature. Chemicals and drying, in fact, they can withstand such uh, conditions. Humans can easily ingest this small cyst, and many have been exposed to all these uh, dangers or harm. Yet the immune system comes to the rescue and eliminates the cyst, keeping them under control. And again, individuals with a weakened immune system due to stress or illness, however, may experience outbreaks uh, curable with um, helps. Uh, uh, we also have tapeworms. Briefly, let me mention them. Uh, they are common throughout the world. The world. Tapeworms are long and ribbon-like. Humans can ingest tapeworms larvae by eating raw or undercooked uh, beef pork and fish or from coming in contact with infected animals or contaminated grains. Tapeworms live in the intestine and absorb nutrients through their skin. 
people with the tapeworms infection feel one dizzy as dizziness toxic have unclear thinking high and low blood sugar level hunger pains poor indigestion and allergies so many reactions you would experience what about flukes we say there are various flukes a species of flukes that are tiny flat worms that look like odd shaped pan pancakes uh, and this include blood flukes fish flukes intestinal flukes liver flukes lung flukes lymph flukes and pancreatic flukes humans can become infected by eating raw or undercooked seafood eating infected vegetation like water chestnuts or water scrapes or drinking or washing in infected water. Once inside the body, flukes migrate to various organs and may cause liver swelling, jaundice, weakened lungs, and blood clots. These are the symptoms you will experience generally. The parasites such as roundworms feed off the human waste in the intestine. And the symptoms of various worm infestations include itching, usually of the anus or vaginal area, weight loss, increased appetite, abdominal pain, bowel obstructions, vomiting, disturbed sleep, worms present in the stools of vomit diarrhea, particularly adult worms can be seen, you know, in the stool or even the diarrhea, I mean in the vomit. Diarrhea too can be experienced, a person at weight risk too, and then anemia, loss of blood, symptoms of pneumonia as a result of lungs infected because they migrate all through. And then food poisoning symptoms, aching muscles or joints, uh, particularly the trachinella spiralis species I was talking about, or a generally feeling of illness. These symptoms can range from barely noticeable to every severe. I just listed some few of the protozoan species, namely amoebiasis, because it's a disease condition caused by amoeba histolytical or entamoeba histolytical, amoebic dysentery, goes the same way avian malaria malariosis babesiosis as a result of tick infection balantidosis and then black water fever chagas disease uh, coccidiosis enterohepatitis and gadiasis each leishmaniasis malaria sleeping sickness toxoplasmosis trachomoniasis and trypanosomiasis this is just the few of the protozoan species I've mentioned. Uh, there are other roundworms too that I would have mentioned. There are other tapeworms too I would have mentioned. And so, but again, uh, that will serve as an assignment to every student should go and find out and list the types of tapeworms and the roundworms you know about, with the exception of the protozoans already have listed. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I do go on.